האנגלית, ותוביל אותה גברת קרוליין גליק, שמבחינתי קרוליין היא מהבודדים בישראל שמצליחים להיות כל כך חריפים ומדויקים גם בעברית וגם באנגלית ברמה כל כך גבוהה, אני כל פעם מתפעלת מזה פשוט מחדש. קרוליין היא בעלת טור בחירה בישראל היום, היא כותבת בבמות יהודיות רבות בישראל ובעולם, היא שימשה כפובליציסטית בחירה בג'רוסלם פוסט, בעיתון מעריב, בברייטבארט, וקרוליין היא קול משמעותי ומבריק בכל הקשור לביטחון ישראל ויחסיה עם ארצות הברית. ויחד עם קרוליין אני מתכבדת להזמין לבמה את אחד האנשים שאני יותר נהנית לצפות בהם מדי ערב במסך שלי, אחד האינטלקטואלים השמרנים הבכירים ביותר מעבר לים, פרופסור ויקטור דייוויד הנסן. הנסן הוא פרשן אסטרטגיה מוכר בארצות הברית, בכיר במכון הובר, שם הוא עומד בראש קבוצת המחקר של היסטוריה צבאית. הנסן גם ידוע כהיסטוריון של התקופה הקלאסית. ואתם, קהל יקר, כנראה מכירים את שמו מהספר ניצחון המערב, כיצד הכריעו ערכי החירות את הקרבות הגדולים בהיסטוריה שהופיע בעברית בספריית שיבולת. ואפרופו שיבולת, נספר לכם שהנסון הוא גם חוואי, הוא מבקר בולט של מגמות חברתיות הקשורות לחקלאות. And now allow me to read to you the title of Victor's latest book, as it is related to the topic of today's conversation. The Dying Citizen, How Progressive Elites, Tribalism, and Globalization Are Destroying the Idea of America. And as we here know, not only the idea of America, but also the idea of Israel, and honestly, almost every Western nation is experiencing a similar threat. Professor Victor David Hansen, Ms. Caroline Glick, welcome. אנחנו נדבר באנגלית, אני חושבת שטל אמרה את זה, כי אומנם ויקטור חבר מעולה של ישראל, מהטובים שיש לנו, אבל הוא עוד לא הספיק ללמוד עברית. אז אנחנו נעבור לאנגלית. I, I just said something really mean about you. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I said we have to speak in English, because even though you're among Israel's best friends, you still haven't gotten around to learning Hebrew, well, you've been too busy learning Greek and, I, I and Latin. And... I could say it's Greek to me, but I know Greek. But... Right. <laughs> so, I don't know, it's um, Swahili? Do you speak Swahili? Yes, yes. You do speak Swahili? What? You don't speak Swahili? No, I don't. Oh, okay. Um, so this is a great pleasure for me. Me too. I've known Victor for 20 years, something like that. Um, but I've never had the honor of sharing a stage with you. Same here. So this is going to be fun. Um, Victor, you just wrote a really important book uh, called uh, The Dying Citizen. Um, and before we get into the nitty gritty, I mean, would you just sort of spend a few minutes giving us the basic concept of the book, and then I have some very uh, you know, hard questions for you to answer here. Well, I just wanted to remind everybody that what we do in the United States and what you do in Israel is the exception in history that most societies are not constitutional. Over half the countries in the world today are not. It was very late in the development of civilization. Civilization is 8,000 years old. Constitutional government or consensual government is only 2,500 years old. So we should, and it's very frail, and I think people should realize that. And then another theme of the book very quickly is that when you combine market capitalism, as you do and we do, with constitutionally guaranteed freedom, it's the, it's the only thing that creates renaissance, the good life, so to speak, but we have to be very careful because people from Aristotle to Tocqueville said that it also creates a leisure, 
at best or a decadence at worst. And remember Aristotle reminded us that once a person is equal politically, and that's what is guaranteed under Western democratic systems, naturally he believes that he should be equal in every other aspect of his life economically, and the government has a responsibility to ensure that. And here in the United States, that is the sort of the unfortunate exegesis of wokeism. Behind wokeism is that we are going to do everything in our power to make everybody the same. And if we don't do that, somehow our ancestors, our place names, our heroes, our founders are culpable. And so I, in reaction to that, I wrote The Dying Citizen very quickly, and it was how citizenship is disappearing in the West. And there were pre-modern uh, efforts or catalysts. One of them was the end of the middle class. Aristotle said, if you don't have a middle class, you have no chance for democracy. The poor are subsidized by the government. The wealthy have too much influence to warp governance. In addition to the middle class, you have to have secure borders. This is very important for Israel because you can't expand the idea of democracy all over the world without diluting it at home, and you have to know that you have a unique culture. We don't have a border on our southern, our southern border. It doesn't exist anymore, and we're paying the price. The third is tribalism. That is that if you have a consensual society and you don't want to turn into Yugoslavia or Rwanda or Iraq, you have to have a common core of beliefs. And they have to transcend uh, superficial appearance. Here in the United States, we are making race essential rather than incidental to who we are. And that explains a lot of our problems. And it's a, an age-old, deleterious, and fatal uh, characteristic of a society, a consensual society that's disappearing. And then very quickly, we have postmodern efforts that are destroying the citizen. One of them is what we call the administrative state, people who are unelected and combined judicial, executive, and legislative power under one person each or bureau. They have enormous resources and are not accountable. We, whether in their FBI, CIA, IRS, they, they're much more powerful than elected officials. You have similar problems, I'm, as I imagine. Then we have evolutionaries that believe that human nature changes. It always gets better. If we just have more power from government, we can change the essence of per people. Therefore, our founders, being 18th century old white men that weren't as sophisticated as us, we have to change all the protocols that they established and the things that have grown up since. So get rid of the electoral college because it doesn't give us instant results. Pack the court to 15 judges. Get rid of the Senate filibuster after 180 years. Get rid of the idea of a 50 state union, bring in two. Have a national voter law that bans IDs at the poll. Anything that would and guarantee an equality of result and show us that our generation has evolved in a way that our primitive ancestors did not. And then finally, globalization or the ancient idea of cosmopolitanism that you are not citizens of Israel and I'm not citizens of the United States, that we're citizens, citizens politi of the two cosmu of the world. Our allegiance is to the Davos people, it's to our bi coastal American elite. The idea that the International Criminal Court or the World Health Organization or the Parrot Climate Accord have more wisdom and authority because they're ecumenical than you do. And yet every time in history that anybody dreamed up such a crackpot idea, Alexander the Great's Brotherhood of Man, Napoleonic Continental System, the League of Nations, the United Nations, they all prove to be as strong as their weakest link, and the weakest link is always an equivalent of something like North Korea or Iran. And out of that pessimistic uh, appraisal, I'll finish by saying that all of these problems that we're experiencing in the United States revolve around the death of the citizen. If you put all the things a citizen can do 50 years ago, vote, hold office, travel in and out of the country without documentation other than a passport, serve in the military, uh, participate in a, all that's left in the United States is holding office. Every other uh, once exclusive privilege is open to anybody who's residing on American soil. And uh, it's, it's very sad because this was not a cause of a volcano 
a disease, a foreign power. This was a suicidal, self-created uh, phenomenon. So you're supposed to encourage me to be more optimistic. No, <clears throat> I'm pretty pessimistic myself. Okay. But, um, but, but I think, you know, before we go into the questions that I prepared, I mean, I think the issue of equality is so interesting, right? Because, uh, first of all, I mean, it's, it was quite prescient on, on the part of Aristotle to say that. Yeah. But it took a long time. There's always been a struggle between equality of opportunity and equality of ends, and the equality of ends always leads to totalitarianism, and the equality of opportunity always leads to freedom. So it's sort of interesting that the one thing, the equality of, of ends, has now managed to, to win. After all of these years, when it didn't, I mean, what do you, was there some trigger that you can point to that suddenly changed the way that people understand what equality is geared towards? I think so. I think uh, this may seem controversial, but under the original calculus, a, a Western government, whether it was Greece or Rome or and later Western Europe, the idea was that we're going to give everybody the opportunity to succeed, and those who won't because of bad luck or health, laziness, or nothing, something beyond their control. There were other mechanisms to coerce or persuade the, the successful to help them, and chief among them was religion, that everybody has a soul, we have a common humanity, and we're to help our brother who is less fortunate. But when you turn over that religious feeling to the state, or you have an agnostic or atheistic uh, individual, they have no natural compassion, so they outsource that to the state, and that sort of relieves their guilt. And then the state becomes more powerful. And we even have invented, reinvented this word equity to substitute for equality. And the equity is a forced equality result. And so I think the rise of Western secularism uh, explains why we no longer have the ability to expect or to anticipate the, the well-off and the successful will naturally help their friends, their family, their community, and that they know best or better, at least, than the government how their funds should be, go for the betterment of their communities. But once you, you, you not only take away that religious component, but you demonize it and you see it as a symptom of retrograde uh, thinking or primitive de mental development or whatever, then you've lost that that anecdote for inequality. You know, uh, we, uh, I, th I think the loss of religion, first and foremost, and its substitution with government is something that's, that's so vicious because it's been led by elites, that the first to sort of embrace atheism rather than Judaism or Christianity are the ones who are closest to power. That, and as a result, they're able to sort of force that onto the rest of that. And in Israel, we had an amazing um, uh, district court decision uh, yesterday, which overthrew a magistrate court, it's our lower court uh, decision. It was a question of whether if a Jew goes up to the Temple Mount and uh, prays Shema Israel, which is the declaration of faith for all Jews. You learn it when you're, before you know how to say mama. Mm -hmm. And if you go up to the Temple Mount and you say Shema Israel, then you're committing a crime. And the magistrate court said, no, this isn't a crime. And the district court, uh, after our elites started screaming, how can you say that? It's a provocation. Judaism is a provocation. You know, I mean, God is a provocation, right? The, the district court agreed. It's, uh, it's a crime for a Jew to go up on the Temple Mount and say that it's pretty I think that's, incredible. there are counterparts to that all over the Western world, and it, it really is a phenomenon of the professional, educated, and wealthy classes. Part of it is they've distanced themselves from muscular labor, agriculture, mining, timber, and they don't realize how tenuous life is, that we're always one day away from starving this supply shortage, what we see in Ukraine, the COVID lockdown. It's, it's starting to remind us that the people who produce things with their hands, there's a nobility and we need to recognize that because most of these neuroticisms, and this is what you mentioned is a neurotic tick, 
come from the very wealthy and the very privileged, and they feel that almost like medieval penance, that because they're so privileged, they have to find some symbolic way to show that they are uh, one with the so-called oppressed, so they find these abstractions rather than something concrete and material which would come at their own expense. I, we see it in the United States when you know, a Nancy Pelosi, just to take one example, is an adamant opponent of a wall, the sort of walls that you have, the sort of walls that, border, that border we, wall. border wall, that we would, we have half. And yet if you see her estate in Napa, it's covered with a wall. Or people in the United States are adamant that charter schools are bad, teachers unions are good, and yet their children are all in privileged uh, prep schools. And so as a means of, of saying, you know what, I'm very, very progressive, but I'm very regressive in my own, I, I have to square that circle, so I need a cause in the abstract that won't hurt me, but like medieval, instead of being whipped in the medieval penance and the Christian sense of, you know, signing a thing and saying, you know what, I'm a sinner, I'm an ursurer, so I will pay so many gold florins for a block on the dome of St. Peter's, they say I will support uh, tearing down the wall on the southern border. That makes me feel really good, and therefore I get to have a wall around my own home. So that's a lot of what it, what's at the, the heart of this. You know, it's the levels of abstraction, right, that, that distance our elites from what's real, what's substantive, what, what you need in order to live that's really becoming a graver and graver danger. I just look at it from the perspective of the U.S. economy. I... I, I, I um, there was an article in Tablet yesterday that was doing a different analysis of the Russian economy and the Chinese economy where they were basing it not on GDP, uh, annual GDP, but on purchasing power parity. And when you look at Russia and its PPP, you see that its economy is not what people say, the size of um, Spain or Italy's, but the size of Germany's. And then you start understanding that the blowback that we're seeing from the economic sanctions are enormous, and also that they make things, they make minerals, they make gas, they make oil that people need. That's the basis of their economy, and so their importance to the global, to the global economy is much larger than, say, a service-based economy that's, you know, its chief export is management consultants or what have you. So, you know, it, it's different here. I just wanted to bring it back to our conversation, though, about the dying citizens. You know, here in Israel, we have a concept um, that I don't know whether it exists or it has existed in, in this form for so long in the United States of the gatekeeper. I mean, citizenship is the Athenian model. The Roman model is that you have responsibility and you have authority. I mean, Athens, obviously, is the example where everything was by plebiscite for the citizens deciding things. And here, the concept of gatekeeper is that you have appointed officials, civil servants, legal advisors, generals, what have you, and they act as the gatekeepers to power, dividing power not only from the population, the citizenry, but from elected officials. And they're the arbiters of whether a prime minister or a defense minister can make a decision or not. And that seems to degrade the very concept of citizenship at the outset, doesn't it? Yeah, I think, I mean, at one time, classical Athens had 20,000 people involved in boards and regulatory bodies, everything from the sewers to voting. So I think what happens in Western societies, as they're promised to allow people greater freedom and choices and greater prosperity with the protection of private property and capitalism combined with guaranteed rights, the expectations keep increasing and increasing and increasing and the demands on the state and the, the state grows. And so then you create what you refer to this professional class and unfortunately they understand a Jerusalem or a Washington better than the revolving door elected officials. So in our country, a Lois Lerner at the IRS, a James Clapper, the Director of National Intelligence, a James Comey at the FBI, their attitude is these people come and go, but we have mastered the system, so at some point they will have to come to me 
for help or advice, and I'm going to, and then people know that I'm going to outlast them, and then they have the resources at the state if they want to go after you or you or you. Legally, they can issue an edict as an executive. They can reinterpret the statute as a legislator, and uh, as a judge, they can adjudicate whether your appeal is valid or not. And so they're very dangerous people. And I wish I could say the answer is just to cut. It would be easy just to cut them, but that's the answer. In our country, if we just took the FBI and the IRS and the Department of Agriculture and broke it up and put one in Oklahoma and one in Texas and got rid of this Washington swamp, it would be amazingly uh, helpful. So the concentration of power, uh, government power, in a small geographical area is, is really dangerous to the citizen. So uh, the follow-up question to that was just going to be whether the concept of gatekeeper, in Israel we've had it and it's become much more powerful, say, in the last generation than it was in the past, although it's arguable whether that is the case or not because you could also say that they only began to feel threatened in 1977 when we had the first change of power between the Socialist Labor Party and the, and the Likud Party. Uh, with Menachem Begin. So it's a question of whether the concept of gatekeeper always existed or not. And, and the, I guess the follow-up question was whether it exists anywhere else. And obviously you just showed that it exists in the United States. But there, there's another aspect to our elite that I don't know. I, 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 had, um, I have a podcast, which you're going to have to do, obviously. Uh, <laughs> But I was speaking last week with my colleague Amnon Lord from Israel, and we were talking about the elite. And he made a point that I think was very key. He said that there's something unique about the Israeli elite, and maybe it exists with the French, I don't know, but that they're not at all embarrassed about it. Like they're very, they're very forthright. You're not one of us. You don't have a right to speak. We get to decide everything. Who are you, Johnny? Come lately. You know, you can't tell us what to do. And they're proud of it. They think that the state belongs to them because their parents or their grandparents were the pioneers in pre state days, or they latched on to the establishment after they came here. And the concept of democracy is very alien to them. They, they don't, the, the, they're, they don't have this concept of majority rule or that the people have a right to decide. Uh, Amnon quoted David Ben-Gurion, who said something to the effect of, the people don't know what uh, to do, we tell them what's good for them. Yeah. And um, do you feel when you're looking at the lowest learners and the James Comeys of this world that the people who have really come out of the shadows in the United States as gatekeepers. And you see with the Russia uh, Trump thing and all the rest of it, do you think that they've also lost touch with the mothership, with, with democracy, with a concept of, of that? Oh, absolutely. And they have counterparts in the private sector. Our elite feel that when globalization took hold, people from Seattle to La Jolla, California were looking at the Asian tigers in China, and people on the East Coast from Boston to Washington were looking on the EU, and they had particular transferable skills, media, finance, uh, international business, entertainment, professional sports, and suddenly their markets were seven billion rather than 300 million, and they became fabulously wealthy. I mean, six trillion dollars in Silicon Valley in a 30-mile radius. Six trillion dollars of market capitalization. So what that created was this sense that we are, there was a God, if they don't believe in God, but they believe if there was a God, he blessed me with this wealth. And it was because I'm, I have a degree from Stanford or Harvard or Yale, or I'm on a top 500 company, but they have a sense of entitlement. So Look at Bill Gates. He's, he just announces that the World Health Organization did a great job and China did a great job. This was a country that probably allowed this leak that's plagued us all. Or Anthony Fauci saying, I am the science. 
are uh, and so many could, people agreeing with him. Yes, or Mark Zuckerberg. I'm Facebook. You can't eat Facebook. You can't drink Facebook. You can't drive Facebook. But it's Facebook, and he is worth a seventy, eighty billion dollars. So he decides. I'm going to spend $419 million and infuse it into a select precinct, and I can alter the election, what the left used to call dark money. So these people feel that they have a, a God-given right because they were the winners under globalization. And the counterpart of that is they look at the interior of the United States, and they see high suicide rates or deindustrialization. They look at Youngstown, Ohio, and they say, these people were losers. They never learned to code. They never got a global market. And they even have developed a vocabulary for them. If you took what Barack Obama invented linguistically or Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden, think of the vocabulary. Clingers, deplorables, irredeemables, chumps, dregs. They all use that in public as a euphemism, I guess it's a euphemism, of the great unwashed former uh, middle classes. And yet, as we see right now in the United States, you can't find a plumber. You can't find an electrician. You can't find a sheetrocker. You can't build a car on time. You got plenty of advisors, political advisors, consultants, techies, but ultimately a society depends on people who can physically do tasks to keep us alive one more day. And if there's any good at, out of this tragedy of COVID, I think it'll be a reappreciation of the middle classes who are muscular in nature. I hope so, but in the meantime, they're being squeezed. I mean, they're being squeezed in this country as well. And it comes to a question, I think, that it's at the heart of the economic debate between traditional conservatives of the free market concept of comparative advantage and the um, populists, for lack of a better term, but that they say that there are certain industries that we need. And you started this debate, at least for me, in a book you wrote, I don't know, decades ago, Field Without Dreams, about th the way that the industrialization of agriculture, I think under Reagan, destroyed the family farm. And the economics of it makes sense, but the social costs of destroying the family farm in the United States are enormous, and we're feeling them to this day. You know, that, that reminds me, in um, 1982, the price of raisins, just take an esoteric crop that we grew, was $1,420 a ton. The break-even price was about 1000 And uh, under the, uh, the effort to curve hyperinflation, it was necessary, high interest rates, et cetera, the United States also had a free market open trade. So we had the EU and most of the NATO countries with very high tariffs about raise their raisins and subsidies of about $800 a ton. So they were shipping uh, raisins that were far more expensive to grow in Greece or in Spain into the United States, which crashed the price. So it went in 12 months from $420 to $400. And in every 100 acre farm, and these were people who were on the school board, the little league teams, all of this checkerboard, they went broke. And they asked me, I was a, a smart, I won't say ass, but I was a smart ass. It's a very cocky young kid that had gone to graduate school but gave it up and was farming full time. They said, Victor, you go with us to meet this Reagan official. So this guy came out, and he started the discussion, there's only 5,000 of you, you're lucky I'm here. And I said, well, what possibly should we do? And he said, this is good for you. I said, how could it be good for you? He said, it's creative destruction. And I said, well, I, I know Hayek and all that, that's good in the long term, but tell me exactly how it could be good. He said, well, it's lowered the price for the American consumer. I said, not to the same degree, that the middleman made up most of the difference, the consumer's not getting much of a break. Well, it weeded out the wheat from the chaff, so the people who will go broke would have gone broke anyway. I said, no, they've been here for 100 years. And then he said, the ones that survive, will be, they'll, they'll hone their skills. And I said to him, well, why not go down to $100 a ton, or what my grandfather had, $30 a ton in the Depression. We can go down there if you like. But 
the point is that we're all market capitalists, but we have to resist that urge to always go one um, step beyond what is humane. And I think that's what happened in parts to the Republican Party. That was the idea that we're going to have, uh, we're just going to have an unleashed laissez-faire and we're not really going to worry whether the United States has necessary industries or we can make protective masks or gowns or we can produce penicillin, which we haven't done from, since 2004. So I think part of this, what Carolyn's referring to, there's an effort at least to say we have to be nationalist and patriotic within the confines of conservative support for free markets. But free markets cannot be antithetical to national interests. They just can't be out there in a Davos-like setting where capital goes anywhere it wants without regard to national interests. The, the, the national legislature, Knesset, House, Congress has to be superior to any international organization, whether formal or informal. Yeah, okay. So I think, you know, one of the things you see, and I was, I'm in the middle of reading Michael Anton's book, where, which starts with this horrible uh, description, I mean, it's an, a brilliant description, but it's horrible, of, of the state of California today, and how, and, and we see it in places here, like Tel Aviv, to a, a different degree, because we have different uh, pathologies, but of the middle class being squeezed out, and you have the peasants, and you have the feudal lords, and the free landowners, you know, the homeowners of, of the valley, of the central valley, of the valley in, in Los Angeles, They're, they can't afford houses, their children can't buy houses, and we have, I think, an, an average apartment here costs 300 salaries, so young couples can't buy. Um, and, and there's this sense, really, that you know, we want high-tech, high-tech, high-tech. We want everybody to be perfect in math, perfect in science, which is true. Um, but we need to have industry. You know, we need to have things for people who aren't going to code, who, who think it's really boring and don't want to do it, like, like me. You know? <laughs> no, you're, you're exactly right. I would, I live in a 150-year-old house that had what we call the United States knob and tube wiring. It's very dangerous, and we had a little fire, so I had an electrician. Two guys had been working on it on their weekends, and watching them find out all these con convoluted circuits over 150 years and go like detectives, they reminded me of neurosurgeons. Uh, they had more skill than a neurosurgeon in some ways, and yet we don't equate being a, a lowly electrician with that type of skill, but they're really literally saving our lives. Plumbers we, are cardiac surgeons. Yeah, so I think we really have to, as I said earlier, kind of readjust our, our value system and that people who do these physical things, ultimately when we get in times of crisis, they're the people um, that we, we rely on. And this professional class, they're, they're necessary. And whether you, Israel's national security hinges on high tech, and we have to appreciate that. But we have to have a sense of humility as well that um, at some point, all of that learning and skill has to be on behalf of the entire community. And it has to be, uh, it has to be shared with people of the same nation. I, I once asked a, a colleague at Stanford University who was lecturing me the antithesis of this. So, I made up a hypothetical question. I said, I, I'm going to Paris, and then I'm going to fly to Shanghai, both lies. And I said, could you recommend some restaurants? And he gave me a, a whole list of 10. Bakersfield, California is a metropolis of 600,000. It's only 180 miles away from Palo Alto. And I said, then I'm coming back to Bakersfield. Could you give me some? He said, Bakersfield? I've never been there. But I said, it's in your own state. It's in your own state. You, don't you have any interest? No, I don't have any interest. So there was something wrong with that. And in California, we have, in the same state, 47th in high school test scores, ranked 49th in infrastructure. One out, out of, of 50. Every, yeah, yeah, out of 50. One out of three people in the United States 
on public assistance lives in California, 22% below the poverty line. I could go on, but coupled with the highest income tax, the highest basket of sales taxes, the highest gasoline tax, and yet we're rated 48th again in highways and bridges and airports out of 50 states. And then we have the highest number of zip codes of people uh, that are affluent per capita income, and we have the wealthiest congressional districts all in one state. Why was that? It was policies that drove out 8 million people from California to go to Nevada or Idaho or Florida or Texas with fewer taxes. We had 50% of the people who entered the United States illegally who were very poor from southern Mexico, and we had the, this vast infusion of global wealth and techies. And you put all of that, that into a menu, and it's basically we're run by very wealthy people who out of noblesse oblige feel that the state should serve a peasant class and it despises the middle class on the, on the premise that the middle class lacks the romance of the distance poor but it lacks the culture of the wealthy and it despises them. These are the Winnebago people, the snowmobile people as they say. And it's a, anytime a, a society has a hatred of the middle class, it's in an end stage development. <laughs> So, you know, uh, to go from um, uh, people who imagine problems that they can solve so they can feel good about themselves to actual problems that these people who like to solve imaginary problems prefer, you know, there are real identity problems inside of a lot of these democracies. And I'll just, you know, give a couple, you know, in Israel, we have basically uh, two national groups that operate in parallel, the Jews and the Arabs. And this was, you know, it, 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 uh, it's coming to the fore now in a way that we've never seen before. Uh, there was just a poll that came out, I think, two weeks ago that showed that 75% of Israeli Arabs don't think that Israel has a right to exist. They, don't, they reject the Jewish identity of Israel, and Israel is the Jewish state, so if you reject the Jewish identity of Israel, you say Israel doesn't have a right to exist. That's extraordinary. And in, and in Europe, we had something interesting happen, which was that you have post-war German, French concept of post-nationalism, transnationalism, and the EU was kind of formed in order to repress national identity and the thought, you know, we don't do this well, let's not do it anymore. And then part of that post-nationalism involved open immigration. So then you get these millions and millions of people coming from the third world, and particularly from the Islamic world, into Europe, and they don't accept Western civilization. <laughs> they don't accept the basic concepts that, that animate these societies, and suddenly you see a resurgence of nationalism as a form of self-defense almost from this phenomenon that was caused by post-nationalism. And in the United States, as you said, there's no border with Mexico, you're getting an influx of millions and millions of people who may not be hostile to America, but they don't care about it. And so you have these people inside of your country, each with their very different, you know, uh, animating characteristics. But the question is, if you have these identity crises that are real inside of your society, you know, Forget, it. pretend you can close the border tomorrow, nobody else is coming in. How, what conceptual model do you even use to deal with it? How would you begin to look at this problem? You, you have to have a very strong idea of civic education. And so, and we don't have that in the West in general. In general, or for the majority, or? Yes, everybody. So when a person crosses the border from Oaxaca, one of the poorest areas in the world, and he goes into the wealthiest in California, the educational system has to be able to teach young people when he enters the school and say, this country is a result of market capitalism, an independent judiciary, a constitutional government, and in a idea of rationalism, a separation from church and state, but a, a support for religiosity. And it has to inculcate these American ideals and say to the immigrant, and even though you step foot and you, if you become a citizen, you have just as right as six-generation citizen, but 
you have to realize that you rejected your culture and you adopt, you, you made a conscious choice for ours and we're going to hold it to you. Now, we're going to be enriched around the periphery, your, your food, your music, your fashion. This is what we call multicultural, but it's not the core. We do not want Mexico's judiciary. We do not want Mexico's cartels. We do not want Mexico's uh, chauvinism. We don't want that. And you don't either or you wouldn't have come here. And if you don't have that confidence, and we in America don't anymore, in fact, we look to Israel because you're one country that has no margin of error. We have two oceans. We have a huge military. But you're sort of the canary in the mine that says a Western society even if we wanted to become decadent, we can't because we're in an existential crisis given our neighborhood. And that, I know that's a great burden, but it's also an advantage because that forces you to have confidence in Western civilization and therefore you can be instructive and didactic to the rest of us. What? No, we have one more. We have one more question, which is going to that, which is when I think of our crisis here in Israel, and it's so similar in the United States in so many ways, it's the thing when I said I was pessimistic just like you, it's because sometimes I just feel like we've been tied up in so many different knots, that we're in such a deep crisis because everywhere you turn, there's another, there's another thing blocking you from doing what you need in order to restore freedom, in order to re-empower democracy, reinstate democracy, seize the power back to the people, um, and have not only the responsibility, but again, also the authority to determine the path of your nation. And I'm wondering, is there something that you look at now, I know the midterms are in November, but is, is there one thing that you look at in the United States, so if we can do this, that's sort of the keystone, and then we can use that to pivot to deal with academia or to deal with whatever the other knots are that you're looking at, the regulation, the agricultural policies, the industrial policies. If you do one thing, it can move you. And, and then the last question is, if, is there some guiding concept of how to look at a problem that's so knotted and say, okay, look for one thing first. If you can get to that one thing, whatever it is, it, you know, theoretical concept that you can use to try to figure out what to do to move forward. Well, I think there is, besides, there is core optimism. Just in the last 60 days in the United States, uh, take Netflix. It lost 200,000 of its subscribers in one month. And this was, remember, they paid Barack Obama $50 million, who's now building his third mansion, but uh, to come up with ideas. And then it went completely woke, and the people said, I'm not going to stomach this. Disney Corporation tried to force down a transgender agenda, and it's lost 20% of its value below the stock market loss. And then even Jeff Bezos, remember this, he's the architect of this hard left. I mean, the, the Washington Post was left, but it wasn't quite crazy left. And now he's arguing with his own paper because he feels that he's created such a monster that it, and it might affect his own self-interest. And then we had e the Elon Musk uh, phenomena that's driven the left crazy. So there, is, there are rumblings that people say, Progressivism and leftism is not just a political choice. This is existential. You can't get baby formula. You can't drive a diesel truck at $7 a gallon in California. You can't walk in broad daylight in Chicago. It's too dangerous. These people are suicidal, and if we continue to give them power, they're going to destroy us. And this is coming from the middle classes of all different parties. So I'm, that's optimistic in a pessimistic way. And finally, very quickly to end, what, what value or what guidance? I think it's empathy. Every time that we're in a situation, I, it, you can't be paralyzed by empathy, but you have to say, what is the taxi cab driver thinking right now as he drives me? Or what is the guy who's pumping out my septic tank thinking as he looks at my house and I'm clean and he's f full of crap? 
Not that you're going to be paralyzed or you're going to be artificially, you know, rid your guilt by giving them a tip, but just to think of so many people so different from you, not by their race or gender, but what they do and how they contribute to the society in large. And, if we, and we've lost that empathy, but I think we can regain it. And it's, it's our domain. It's the conservative person who has far more empathy because he values people as people, not as abstractions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.